Unmute. Okay. All right. So I think we're on the road here, and looks like we got a projector and all that. So it's not bad. Okay. Sam, what you think of what John McAfee said about the presidential alerts? I did not see what he said, but he said that Trump was using the presidential alerts to like hack into your. Well, I mean, John McAfee is is basically a lunatic, and lately, and lately, he's back on drugs. He then spent a while claiming he didn't take drugs. Now he's bragging about all the drugs he takes. Um, before this, he was proud of his bevy of teenage prostitutes that he lived with and married and stuff. And before he had to flee uh, for having committed murder and going to hiding. Then he ran for president. I mean, he's just a lunatic. He's really, he's taking the illogical niche that Hunter Thompson is vacating. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that's his whole thing is to sell those Android phones as cryptocurrency things and exaggerate their benefits. So I mean, he, he even he even openly said that he will shill any cryptocurrency for money. He says this repeatedly, and then he does. And, yeah, if anybody listens to me, deserves what they get. So he's, uh, he's kind of like our president. He's discovered that you can just bald faced lie right in front of people, and a bunch of people will keep falling for it, and that can be your career move. So he's, so I mean, if you pay any attention to what he says, other than as a joke, it's a mistake. And he'd even admit that about half the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, um, all right, so I think we're set. There wasn't anything too exciting in the news, uh, and I just wanted to get the. Uh, things visible. So as far as the schedule, I don't have a board to write on, but I don't think I really have to. Let me just see. This is Thursday night. I think we'll stay here. This room seems fine. And so uh, we're just on track. So project six, seven, and eight this week and nine and 10 next week, they were delayed from earlier weeks. So hopefully you've been pulling ahead. Um, and let's take a look at enumeration, which is here. And what was the, this yeah. chapter yeah. is the bottom. The bomb? Really, really, okay. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm surprised. Kind of, you're doing real stuff. Yeah, you're yeah. Actually starting to really do it. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, they're all real stuff. And this here, this actually um is good for people who've been studying Windows because one big issue here is the vulnerabilities in old versions of systems, and that is really important. And with the Internet of Things, it gets more and more important. So um, we'll talk about enumeration. Now, enumeration is uh, listing all the resources that are available on a system that you might want to exploit, like all the users, all the shares, and so on. And this is when you're beginning to connect to the system and see what it's got. So that's the point. You're trying to find what you might want to invade here. You do port scanning and footprinting before this to see what footprinting looks from the outside of the company. And port scanning sees what ports are open. So you might find something like a uh, SMB port open. And then enumeration is finding out what things are shared on that port, things you might want to attack. Um, even port scanning is somewhat intrusive. It involves sending traffic to the target. And enumeration is much more invasive and almost certainly illegal now. Port scanning might be legal, but enumeration is certainly not legal without permission from the company. You're now taking data from the servers of some sort. Although, you know, you, it's never so clear exactly at what point you'll get prosecuted, but you're certainly in the business of uh, taking data from a company that you're probably not authorized to have at this point. Yeah. So when you have like a, you see something that says that somebody's scanning every single port of your computer, would that be illegal? As far as anybody, the question is whether port scanning is illegal. And as far as I've heard, port scanning is not considered illegal. Two things that are perhaps just a little bit shady, but I don't think anyone's ever been prosecuted for, are port scanning and using somebody else's unprotected Wi-Fi network. Technically, both of those are probably a little bit beyond 100% legal, but they're not illegal enough that anybody can really be prosecuted for them. The only case of being prosecuted for port scanning that I know of is if you do it so fast that it amounts to a denial of service attack. Yeah. But, other, but the scanning itself is considered uh, fair use in practice. I would imagine if somebody scanned every single port, yeah. that's clearly attack. Oh it, cer oh, it certainly should set off intrusion detection systems if you scan every port. And if you scan the IP address ranges that are not used, that's commonly used by network monitoring systems as an indicator of attack. So it is certainly true that even if you just do an ordinary NMAP scan, you should set off alerts at the other end, and they might waste time running around, and you might very well get banned for it. 
and that would certainly be legitimate, but I don't think you could prosecute someone for just doing that. However, a, uh, a sensible system would probably interpret you as an attacker at that point and begin distrusting you and blocking your traffic. That would make sense. You're obviously not a normal customer. That's why I'm saying technically you probably exceeded the letter of the law because the letter of the law says if you do an unauthorized things on a server and you are clearly not there to use the server for its intended purpose. You're clearly exploring other things uh, above and beyond that. But since you don't actually recover any data from the server or send any data up to the server, I don't think it's easy to prove you've done enough damage to prosecute you. But certainly. And so NBT scan is one way to do this. NetBIOS is um, the Windows networking protocol that's been around for a really long time. And like many other protocols, it was never intended to be used on the internet. It was invented before the internet and then it ported to run over TCP IP later, like Telnet and completely unsafe, but still used for Windows operating systems. This was Microsoft's competitor for DNS. Long, long ago, DNS, before DNS was around, there were other ways of addressing computers. There was Apple Talk and IPX, SPX, and NetBIOS, and you'd have these other names for things, like these names, Rick HP and Sam P4. Your computers would have alphabetical names up to 15 characters, and that was it. You didn't have IP addresses or ranges or anything because it was only intended for a local area network. You had station one, station two, printer one, printer two, and that, that was it. And this, the problem with this is it doesn't scale to a global network, so people had to switch to TCP IP, but since a bunch of people were used to using this and a bunch of software used it, they ported it to run over TCP IP, and uh, people even had these ridiculous things called WINS servers that hands out the IP address correlation with these NetBIOS names, the way DNS servers are, and that's why if you take a Microsoft server certification, you have to learn these seven ways to resolve a name. And there are, there's a local, there's a cache of recently used TNS names and NetBIOS names and static files for both of those and servers for both of those. And then when all that else fails, you just do a broadcast saying, does anybody know what this name stands for? So if you ping Fred, your computer guesses many different things that Fred might mean and tries to resolve it. Um, anyway, so OS history matters. The old versions of uh, operating systems never die. Um, it may seem to a casual user that things like Windows 95 and MS-DOS don't matter anymore because you don't see anybody carrying around a laptop running them in America, but all that means is they're using it in foreign countries and they're building it into portable devices and infrastructure, selling airline tickets and all sorts of things. You know, uh, it's never really gone. And when you think it's gone, somebody brings it back by making a new device that's running something on top of it. So Windows 95, I'll see, I've got a chat comment coming in. Uh, not sure if audio is being passed. Someone's hearing the audio, other people aren't. Uh, theoretically, the audio should be on. Let me know if something bad is happening like no audio. Here's it. Okay, good. All right, good. Fair enough. Anyway, so uh, Windows 95 was Microsoft's first graphical version of their operating system. Before this, you started with MS-DOS and then type Win and you'd get Windows 3.1 that looked sort of like a, a cartoon, um, very simple. It was basically just a game, and you drag things around on the desktop, and it would then type the commands for you in a hidden screen behind there, really. Uh, Windows 95 didn't start with DOS for the first time, and this introduced the registry, which is a questionable feature of Windows, but a really important one to understand. In Linux, the whole platform is intended to have many people developing things that are not working together. So you develop something like Apache and it is not tied to any version of Linux. You can put it on Debian, put it on Slackware. And so the developers of each package decide what options are available and they put it in a file which is tied to that package and then it doesn't live anywhere particular in the operating system. Uh, so it's kind of weird and confusing. And, and Apache running on Red Hat is in many ways quite different than Apache running on Debian. Microsoft didn't want to do this anymore. They didn't want separate configuration files for each program, so they put everything in the registry, a binary database, which has all the settings for all the operating system components and all the installed software in one big sprawling database. And that's, that started with Windows 95. And this replaced the previous system that had win.any, autoexec.bat, and then separate text files to configure each program you put on it the way Linux did it. This had plug and play although it didn't work very well, but plug and play made it possible for developer to um, include the driver with the operating system. So all you have to do is plug it in and it'll find the driver is already there. 
it didn't actually work very well on Windows 95 because the developers didn't have their drivers ready for it, but it technically existed. And this used FAT16, which was the upgrade from FAT12, which was used for floppy disks. I saw another chat message popping up there. Let me see what it says. Um, troubleshooting. Okay, good, good. All right. Anyway, so uh, Windows 98 was an improvement of Windows 95. Windows 95 was pretty amazing. If you would use your computer Windows 95 and run Word, every two hours it would be the blue screen of death and die. Uh, because it had serious memory leaks, and so did the first version of Windows 98. The memory leak is actually an interesting thing, easy to program. A memory leak is where you allocate memory for temporary storage and you forget to return it. So as you use the program, it keeps allocating more and more and more memory until it uses it all up and crashes. Uh, it's really easy to write programs that do that, and um, Microsoft couldn't find that leak for years. So that because of this, people kept losing all their Microsoft Office documents, and since Microsoft could not patch the leak in the operating system, they added an auto save feature inside Microsoft Office that automatically saved your file every 10 minutes because the machine would blue screen after two hours and you'd get really mad. This way you'd only have to redo the last 10 minutes of work. And this is very, very common. And this is why, you know, the Linux people get a real attitude about Microsoft. Microsoft has an awful lot of situations where there is a serious defect in their product and they don't really fix it. They find a workaround. Like Microsoft Office 2010, if you install it, it does not install the whole Office suite for some reason. It has parts of it that require the CD. And it will frequently ask you to keep putting in the CD when you click on certain menu items, even when you used it before. It doesn't install it. And people could were driving, this was driving you over nuts. So Microsoft fixed that problem by when you install it, it makes a copy of the entire CD on your hard drive. So it can constantly keep reinstalling every time you use things without making you carry the disk around. It's, but of course, their point is to just get the job done with any kind of workaround. But you know, the, the mathematical purists of software development constantly steer at Microsoft for having such ridiculous bugs in their product and not fixing them in the most perfect way. But all they care about is keeping businesses moving. And the fact is just their large disks are cheap, so wasting half a gig of disk space to make an extra copy of the office installers is a small issue to move forward. Anyway, uh, this introduced System Restore, which is very useful. It basically keeps a limited automatic backup of your system files. So if you file up your machine, you can roll back on a calendar to a date in the past and restore most system files to that date. However, it does not restore the metadata of those files, like the creation date and the permissions. So it does not exist on server versions of Microsoft Windows because it is considered too imprecise and it destroys the server. So I used it a lot without realizing this, but it doesn't really restore you all the way back. To really go back, you need an image backup, which came later around Vista. Um, and by the way, I've heard from students, it still does not exist for Apple. I know this one, if you back up an iPhone or an iPad with iTunes, it is not an image backup. It is just a selected backup of certain folders that Apple thinks you're gonna use, because I've done it. If you jailbreak your iPad, and put on weird stuff, and then try to restore with an iTunes backup, you do not get back to where you started. And people tell me this is also true of backups of your entire Mac, Time Machine. The student tells me this, you had yeah, Time Machine, updated the next version, then tried to go back with Time Machine, and it wasn't really going to be back. So it's a strange thing, but Apple does not seem to provide you with any real image backup. Microsoft did for a while. From Vista and Windows 7, Windows 8, they started to hide it. Microsoft's current attitude, as far as I can tell, is that everybody should have a deployment server. They, they tend to do this. They think only huge corporations with a tech department and forget about small businesses and end users. And they have some bafflingly complicated, expensive solution and forget, of, forget about small-time users. But anyway, this was Win9X, and uh, they're still in use a lot. The baggage scanners for the TSA are running Windows 98 with hard-coded passwords that cannot be changed. Uh, Billy Rios found them and published them. Uh, many, many devices you use are running these really old operating systems because people build devices and they expect to use them for 20 or 30 years. And that doesn't fit the computer technology's idea that every two or three years you should upgrade things. They say, well, this thing's only 10 years old. What do you mean upgrade? Yeah. Does that mean that theoretically Oh, you could totally get in. You could you could race the pictures, you could reprogram it, tell it to ignore the guns and knives and stuff, yeah. And you know, this, the TSA had a test of this. Uh, yeah, about a year ago they did this. They, they tested to see how many guns and knives they could sneak through every year they tested. 
And the last test was that 95% of the guns and knives get through the scanner. Because without hacking, Steve, there's no need to Yeah, that was not allowed hacking. That's just probably from human error and stuff. That's right. Yeah, that, but it, it's all the computers are no good, but they're probably not really the weakest spot. Yeah. No, and this is absolutely true. The idea, any kind of portable device like scanning, fingerprinting stuff, all these things are typically running really old, unpatched operating systems because the people that build them don't think they're not computer techs and they don't think about the cycle. They often don't provide any way to update them. They don't think of that when they build it. They build it, it works just now, they sell it, and then a few years later, people are yelling for upgrades. By then, you've left and doing something else. Windows 3.5 came out. This was Microsoft's new technology. Um, came out, I think, in 93. And it improved a lot of things about the Windows operating system. Um, this was Microsoft's attempt to compete with Novell and have servers running on Windows. There was no server version before this. And um, a lot of people did use NTFS domain controllers and start making uh, modern Windows networks in the early version here. Um, and Windows 2000, Server and Professional, was the first version of Windows that would actually stay up for more than a couple days without crashing before the Windows NT servers were laughed at by the Linux community because they wouldn't stay up for more than a week without crashing and they had ridiculous security flaws. Um, Windows 2000 got much better and Microsoft was sued when it came out claiming that they actually ripped a lot of the code off of Linux, but that lawsuit vanished quickly. I think they paid somebody off, um, but it certainly was much more stable and much better. It was a huge improvement over the previous versions of Windows Server and client for that reason. And um, brought in Active Directory, which lets you specify the locations of things like printers in the domain controller, so everybody finds them by going through the domain controller and it's easier to update. Before this, if you put a new printer in, you'd have to go around to every workstation and install like a path to the printer and a driver on every workstation one by one, telling it there's a new printer in town, and now you could just tell the domain controller and it would pass the information on. XP Professional was the big step forward. People have probably forgotten, but people screamed about XP as just wasting all my time, but it's 2000 was great. This is just useless eye candy, cluttering up the screen and changing the menus. Uh, but it added, uh, and Service Pack 2 was the big change at Microsoft, the trustworthy computing metal. When Microsoft decided to care about security for the first time ever, Microsoft's official position had been until this time, 2002, that security was just a waste of time. Is the only point is to make products that work well enough that a normal user who is trying to do their job can use it. You do not bother to deal with a malicious user who's making things just to hack things. That doesn't happen very often. It's a waste of time. So anyway, this added the big things. Windows file protection is a very limited form of um, uh, tripwire, essentially. It keeps, it knows the hash values of all the critical system files and can check and see if they've been modified and replace them with clean copies if they have. Uh, data execution prevention is huge. We're dealing with it in the exploit uh, development class. This uses the NX bit on the motherboard so it can put permissions on memory segments. And the most important one is the NX bit so that memory segments cannot be executed. This where you can therefore have in user data go into a memory segment which cannot be interpreted as executable code and that stops an entire category of buffer overflow exploits. And the Windows firewall. Microsoft had a ridiculous thing called the Internet Connection Firewall before this that was useless. Windows Firewall was their first serious firewall. Before this, everybody had to add third-party firewalls like Zone Alarm or something. And the Windows Firewall came up to provide that feature. This was necessary because Windows 2000 Server had um, TFTP turned on by default. So when you installed the server, it was listening on port 69 without you even knowing it. And there were attacks, I think Bugbear was one of them, that would just crawl up your internet connection onto the machine when you didn't, didn't do anything. Didn't open the browser, didn't do any email. Things would just crawl in the wire and infect you because it was running a server and there was no firewall to stop it. So the firewall was an attempt to improve that. So yeah. On the Windows file protection, would yeah. you describe um, that the top makes hashes of all the uh, Windows yeah. Files um, in comparison, it's been changed and installed it. Yeah. Um, how come that's not a perfect solution for, you know, malware, for rootkit malware? 
it does sound pretty good. Um, in practice, it's not a perfect solution, and I, I don't know exactly why. It sounds really good. Uh, I would assume, yeah, I, therefore, I would usually, from previous experience with Microsoft products, usually what happens is they only do it to about half the files. That's all these defenses sound good until you actually see what they did, and they don't actually have it turned on for every file you need to have it turned on for. That's usually what does it. Like, I know code signing sounds perfect, too. The whole file has a hash value and has to be signed. But in fact, files have seven sections, typically, and there's only three of them that are signed. You can just put code in the other sections, and it doesn't do anything. And in the exploit development class and the malware analysis class, we're taking signed code, modifying it, and running it. And if you go into properties, Windows tells you, oh, yeah, the signature is invalid, but it doesn't stop you from running it. So what was the point of that? <laughs> it's Microsoft often does this. They have a defense that sounds great, and the way they actually apply it, nullifies most of its effect. This happens over and over again, and I think it's because they're so huge. If they, if they really implied a defense at full strength, it would break a whole bunch of legacy software. And so they always have a holes in it, so it doesn't do as much good as you think it would. That's why Linux purists often say, you know, these guys are idiots. But what they are is they're dealing with a really complicated problem. Whereas if you were just running one program on one, one computer, you could apply some defense 100%, but in the world of Microsoft, you couldn't. Maybe she set this. Let's see if uh, lights shine on irritating people. There's no need for that. Let's see. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can you see that? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So you don't know where you are. So if you inject code, even if you're able to inject it, and even if you're able to execute it, you can't find it. And this slowed people down for a while. So here's an example. If you look at nt.dil, it's loaded at um, ntdil.dil is here at 76d8 db. And next time I retry it, it's 77d4. So it randomly moves. This is another thing I wanted to point out, like I said about Microsoft Defenses. It sounds good, but when you actually look at it, it didn't move very much. 76 to 77, and always four zeros on the right. In fact, most um, ASLR in Microsoft Windows only has eight or 10 bits of random randomness. So it actually, a simple way to overcome ASLR is to just run your exploit about a thousand times and you'll get lucky. There's really only 256 or a thousand possible places it can go. It's not really picking randomness as it should. And this is what you almost always find with Microsoft Defenses. They sound good and when you actually look at what they did, they only did half of what they should have. So there's still a bunch of holes. But it does kill the previous generation of exploits that didn't have to hunt for the holes. So Server 2008 brought in um, these products for the server side and a few more things. The most important one here was probably Server Core. Server Core was a response. One of the reasons why Linux remains so popular for servers is that Microsoft kept making their operating system bigger and bigger and bigger, so it's slower and used up more hard drive space. And the Linux people were real proud of the fact that you could strip Linux down to super small. There are versions of Linux that are only one megabyte that fit on a floppy drive and have everything you really need. And so people that want to build a portable device or something, they say, I would never use Windows. It's ridiculous. Linux, you can strip it down. So Microsoft made Server Core, which was a small stripped down version. And they've had it ever since to make a smaller version of Windows for specialty applications. And this brought out Hyper-V, which is Microsoft's enterprise class virtualization product to compete with EXXI server. And by that, people tell me in server 2012 R2, Hyper-V finally starts working really well and now is a pretty serious contender for the virtualization space. Although, yeah, VMware owns this space and Microsoft is not taking their lunch yet. Microsoft does this a lot. They wait until somebody else completely owns the space and then they jump in like a giant, like an elephant jumping in a swimming pool. And often they fail spectacularly, like with phones. They tried to, they tried to take, go straight against Apple for the home phone market and completely failed with a whole series of Windows phones, not one of which sold at all because they weren't much better or much cheaper, which is what they would have to be. But they're trying to break into virtualization with the Hyper-V and Azure, and they're making some inroads. There's some people that like it, but ESX, uh, VMware still owns that space. They're the big one. And Microsoft has not hurt them much yet. Windows 7 came out. User account control was finally adjusted to be less irritating so people didn't turn it off all the time. So the end result is it made you more secure. And they gave everybody a free copy of XP in a virtual machine to make them more comforted in case they were afraid their XP software wouldn't work. But one thing Microsoft is very good at is backward compatibility. You can take something written for an early version of Windows, it will almost always run just fine on the new version because they really care about that because that is important for business. People have their cash registers, their accounting software from 10 years ago, and they don't want to rewrite it and they want to use the latest version. Microsoft really is there for you and Apple is really not there for you. Anything more than one version back, Apple tells you get lost, we don't support it at all, it's your problem. And Linux is totally not there for you. This is one of the reasons why Microsoft remains popular in business, because they really care about business customers, and that is a huge issue with them. I have a huge installed base of old junk that I don't want to replace. Will it work with the new stuff? And the answer is it will. Windows 8 came with antivirus built into it, which Microsoft had tried to put in for a long time. But because of the antitrust lawsuit that nearly split Microsoft in half, Microsoft was very sensitive to antitrust issues. And when the antivirus companies threatened to sue Microsoft if they improved their product so that it wasn't defective and you didn't need to buy antivirus anymore, they would sue them for having destroyed their industry, which is a strange position to take. And eventually Microsoft included their own antivirus and they tried to buy McAfee. And I think they tried to buy Norton, but they wouldn't sell. So they had to buy something called giant anti-spyware which was a pretty low-rated competitor in the anti-spyware market. And this stuff they put in, their built-in antivirus, was just useless. Doesn't do anything. And Microsoft has had been humiliated over and over again at how terrible this is to where they've had to pretty much admit it's not really much good and you really have to pay for third-party antivirus anyway. And this is where they finally implement what you were saying, the secure boot. The secure boot is an attempt to imitate the iPhone and the iPad. The iPhone and the iPad have signed kernels so the part of the operating system 
is controlled by a digital signature, and when it boots up, it verifies the digital signature online, and if it does not match, it won't start up. It says, your machine is broken, go fix it. That would be the end of rootkits. And Microsoft wanted to put that in, but the problem is if they put that in, that would end antivirus software, because the antivirus software has to be in the kernel too. And if one company does not know all the software that goes in the kernel, they don't know what checksum to put on the kernel. So um, if you're going to do that, you have to do what Apple did for the iPhone and the iPad, which is there is no antivirus. There is no firewall. You can't get one. You can't put one on. It's just running Apple's original stuff. And uh, so they, they wanted to put that in. They promised it with Vista. And they put it here, but only for the ARM version of Windows 8, which almost nobody used. Um, but anyway, that's the game there. And Server 2012. Um, now... To deal with past the hash attacks, these are ridiculous. We do them in 124. Um, it turns out that there's an issue of single sign-on. If you want to log into a server once and then keep working all day without having to type their password in again, it has to have some kind of token that it uses to identify you on the network. And for some reason, what Microsoft uses is a hash that's easy to steal. And once you get the hash, you can just use it. So I don't even need to find your password. I can just steal the hash that's flying around the network and reuse it and impersonate you. And Microsoft, this has been a huge problem with Windows domains for about 15 years. It's a common hacker trick to get in. Microsoft now has a siloing system so that you can limit where accounts can be used to try to stop administrators from logging in with high privilege credentials on untrusted workstations. This is what Microsoft has said since my server 2000 is your administrator needs to have two accounts, a low privilege account signing to client machines and surf the internet and a high privilege account which they use only on the server. But nobody bothers, they log in with the domain administrator account on the workstation which is infected with malware, the hacker gets the domain administrator hash, and now the game is over. This almost always works. And it is possible to prevent it from working in Server 2012 if you configure these silos correctly. It's not on by default, but it is possible to restrict the administrator account so you cannot use them on, on dangerous machines. And Windows 10 finally brought back the start button to undo the ridiculousness of Windows 8, which frustrated the whole world. And um, so it's almost as nice as Windows 7. And it had a few other features like Credential Guard, um, trying to reduce, again, past the hash attacks. And Server 2016, which we're using in this class now, um, it has Windows containers. This is another step. Microsoft now embraces Linux. They sell Linux. They support Linux on Azure. They are now building Linux back into the operating system. They put Linux subsystem for Windows in Windows 10, and I think you can put it in Server 2016. You can now put Bash natively on Windows, although it's pretty strange. It's not exactly equal to Bash. And um, they now joined Docker. And they open sourced their stuff and they're supporting Windows containers, although I've never used them yet. Containers are really important. Containers are the replacement for virtual machines. If, when I first heard about virtual machines, it seemed really stupid to me because you have an operating system that's maybe five gigabytes. Then you have a virtual machine, you have to make another copy of those five gigabytes, have a second copy of all those files, then you install a product on there. That doesn't really make any sense, and containers fix that problem. They have something called um, a layered file system, overlay FS. So when you make a container, it doesn't make an extra copy of any file if a copy of that file exists on the host. So if you were to put a Windows machine on a Linux server, you'd get no benefit. But if you put a Linux virtual machine on a Linux server, 90% of the files are already there, and it doesn't make a second copy. So your container is 10 times smaller or even less and much faster. And you can easily have 10 or 20 or 30 containers running at once on a machine, which can only have two or three virtual machines running. So it is much faster, much cheaper, easier to deploy, much smaller. Um, and it is a way to separate one application from another. But they're not as separated from each other as virtual machines. They are considered less secure than VMware, but much cheaper. And this is why... Um, you can do things like run a server and let 100 students practice Linux and each get their own container, which is like their own Linux machine, which is independent from the others in practice, but they're in fact sharing files on the hard drive to make it smaller and faster. Containers are really big and Windows is trying to get in that game with Windows containers. I've never seen anybody using Windows containers yet, but it would make the same sense there. I guess you could have your server 2016 and you could run 10 container servers on top of it to separate different tasks so one task wouldn't leak into the other. Um, all right, I've got the about that stuff. Let me, uh, let me dish.
but I need Kahoot, which should be someplace here. Okay. I log in, and theoretically, it's ready in my favorites. There we go. All right. Loading something. And this is great. The screen is now high enough. I don't need to worry about it being visible. We're much better off here than that other room. All right. This room in particular had a horrible projector. You could barely see. This is a lot better. this stuff popping up again but all right oh there's Erica backwards today all right All right, I'll wait a few more seconds. Guess that's it. Okay. So when did the firewall come in? By the way, I should mention something which surprised me. Firewall is extremely useful. When you install a version of Windows, an old version of Windows with no firewall and connect it to the internet, it gets infected within one day. But if you just turn on the Windows firewall, it takes a year to get infected. It really makes a huge difference for your security, which I had not expected. Anyway, um, all right. What version of Windows first had authentication silos? <laughs> Okay, that was server 2012, and, and this Saturday, I've been working the last several days programming something. This Saturday is all about the competition class practicing configuring firewalls. So anyway. All right, what version of Windows introduced ASLR? It's very powerful. The big one in XP, oh, I thought it was XP Service Pack 2, but I guess it was Vista. Okay, Service Pack 2 had DEP, but not ASLR. Made a big, really slowed down all the buffer overflow exploits. All right, which one had antivirus for the first time? Windows 8, for what it's worth, which is not much. Which one had server core? Okay, 2008 had it, and it's the default. Anyway, that's the game there. Let me make a note of winners. Those look like real names. That's handy. Jeffrey A., that's a real name. O&M. And Patrick. Good. Save that someplace. All right. Well, um, I guess it's 10 minutes to 7. Let's take a break till 7. Then we'll finish this up. It's a logical time for a break. I will pause the recording, but not the share. It, it certainly is the case that, um, that the thing we're seeing in the election is that social media and the internet are having a much larger effect on how people think than before, and we're beginning to get really upset about that, and the immediate thing people do is try to censor the internet, which is, I think, a very unwise way to handle it, but that's where we're going. <laughs> but that's, that's the issue, and I really think the Russians are just one of many players, and I think we are the main aggressor. But anyway, well, let's carry on back to these slides for a while. Yeah, I mean, we are, we, own, we made the internet, we have most of the computers, we have most of the criminals, we have most of the good guys. We are the big player here. It is, 
we can't pretend that Russia and China are the big aggressor. That's why every talk about China hacking us, which they do, they keep saying, but you guys hack us, that's the bigger problem. And it is probably, yes, the bigger problem in the grand scheme of things. Anyway, so NetBIOS is this programming interface to let machines connect over land. The BIOS is the basic input output system when your machine boots up that finds things like the keyboard and the hard drive so your machine can start. And the NetBIOS looks on your local area network for network things like file shares and printers. That was the idea. And so you give the, each machine this name that can be up to 16 characters and it must be unique on each device. And that uh, you have these various types of devices. One of them is called the master browser which has the master list. This had a bizarre effect that it could take up to 12 minutes for your machine to register itself at the master browser and up to 12 minutes for your machine to update its database from the master browser. So you could like turn on a printer and it could be 24 minutes before you'd see it in your list. It was very strange. Before this with MS-DOS, they had this system where every single device on the network has to broadcast its existence every 10 seconds. I'm a printer, I'm a printer. You want to print something? Everything would do this. And the problem is it clogged up the whole network of broadcast junk. So to prevent it, they switched to this system, which was extremely slow, but didn't have as much broadcast. But anyway, everything is on your network and can be reached this way. And they invented this strange thing, which I've never heard anybody explain. If you are, turn on a Microsoft network with, with this, this NetBIOS system and you share something and you try to connect to it, it'll say, you're not authorized. You have to log in first, and you have to log in with an empty username and an empty password. Now you're authenticated, now you can see things. I don't know who thought that those credentials meant you were privileged now, but that is really how it worked, and that's called a null session. With a null username and a null password, you get all kinds of information that you should not get, like uh, how often people have to change their passwords and which account is the administrator account in case it's been renamed, and a lot of things that are really none of your business. Anyway, uh, it's pretty much turned off in the modern version of Windows. Um, and uh, it'd be sort of interesting historically to find out what somebody was thinking about this. Uh, the security identifiers are worth mentioning. Every account on a Windows machine has this long number identifying it. The same thing's true in Linux. And the built-in accounts have a, a, there's a short number at the beginning and a long random number after it. The, the administrator account is 500 or 501, and the user accounts created after that started 1,001 and count up. And it's the same thing in Linux. Um, every, that's why you can have two users with exactly the same username, but they're uniquely identified by this security identifier, like a social security number. And so NBT stat will enumerate the net BIOS table so you can see what's on your network and uh, from Linux also, I think this is a Windows tool. Yeah, this is the Windows version of it. And you can use net view to see what machines are on your network and you can use net use to connect to them. NetView will let you see the machines, and NetView will first let you see all the machines on your network, and NetView followed by a machine name or an IP address will show you what that machine is sharing. Um, and NetUse is how you connect to it from the command line. So anyway, you can do this with other tools. Um, there are some tools like Enum for Linux that will do NetBIOS enumeration on Windows networks from a Linux machine. And um, here's Enum for Linux doing it, so it's hunting through the network, finding it's a work group instead of a domain. Those are the two types of Windows networks. Work groups are networks without a domain controller, and ones with a domain controller are called domains. Um, and so DumpSec is another tool that will let you connect to a server and dump off a lot of permissions about the way things are shared on the network, on Windows networks. And that's enumeration. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't really know that. I think you're right, largely just for network administration, and I think hacking tools are also part of it. I, don't, I think a lot of things, it's not really clear, like Nmap. Nmap, some people call it an attack tool, other people just think of it as network administrator. Once you learn how to hack, I don't understand how you ever got through the day without it. Because you frequently connect to something, you don't know what's out there, and you wish there was a way to scan it, and this is handy. Yeah, so, I mean, tools have both purposes. The Hyena is a GUI product for managing Windows systems. And this will show you all the network resources that are available with a nice GUI like that. Usually tools like this are ones that cost money that give you these nice GUI presentations uh, laying out the network. Nessus is the most popular vulnerability scanner. It's also got a free version, which is quite powerful. And I think you can get the full version for free for academic use or something. They keep changing the rules. But it's very popular. It's been around forever. 
Um, it will just try to find all the vulnerabilities. So it sends many thousands of packets to every device it could find, testing for this phone and that phone and that phone, going through a long list of vulnerabilities and trying to decide which ones are present. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Using the, I'm using this class a few times and we use it next class. Yeah, it's slow. And the thing to know about vulnerability assessment tools is they're very sloppy. They lie a lot. They fail to find vulnerabilities that are there and they freak out and report vulnerabilities that are not really there a lot. So the only good thing about them is they really will click on every link and go in every folder and try everything. And they'll do a sloppy job of looking at every spot. And you have to go back after it and verify the findings. You will find that a bunch of the stuff it reports is not true. And you will find a bunch of stuff that it didn't find because an automated tool can't really navigate very well through a network. It can't get past a password or a box you have to click here to go further or anything. So it misses stuff. And it often misunderstands what it gets. It sends some packets to the server. It gets some stuff back, which it doesn't understand. So it flags it as a vulnerability, but it's not really the vulnerability. It's just something that confused the scanner. Open, yeah, and OpenVAST is the completely free clone of a fork of Nessus. So that one's around, uh, use this thing called Greenbone. I had it in this class one time. I might put it back in. I've got room for a couple more projects in this class. I haven't quite decided what to throw in. Um, and then if you want to enumerate Unix, there are many, many versions of Unix. This is why one thing uh, Bill Gates said when he was in charge of Microsoft, he said, I'm not afraid of Unix because there are so many. I'm only afraid of it when there is just one. But they were secretly funding lawsuits to punch Unix. They were definitely undermining Unix, but lying about it and hiding that which all came out eventually. Uh, they funded uh, the um, SOC. There's this other company whose name I forget, three letters, that claimed SCO, claimed to own Unix with a very specious argument. And Microsoft funded them to start huge lawsuits claiming to own Unix and to just delay it out for year after year in court so that there was a cloud hanging over Unix, this threat that maybe you'd be guilty for copyright infringement and have to pay a huge fine if you used Unix. And that's the way Microsoft liked it. So they managed to delay it for like eight years. And the Unix community punched back with the uh, MS Blast worm, which was written to punish Microsoft. Anyway, um, now Microsoft has given up the fight and just accepted the Unix as part of the world and they're gonna support it like everything else. There is no getting rid of Unix. Everyone has both Unix and Mac and Windows on their networks. They're both important and you have to support them both going forward. They have both pretty much given up pretending they can wipe out the other. Maybe five years ago, the Unix people kept saying, we'll have Linux on a desktop and you'll never use Windows again. And that's totally not happening. <laughs> and the other thing is totally not happening either where you get rid of them. They're both here for a reason. Anyway, um, all these other things are Unix. The Mac is Unix, iOS 10 is Unix, Android is Unix. Uh, Unix is most of the computing world now because it's on the portable devices. The City College network is like 90% Android and iOS. Windows is down in the single digits now. It's popular in the rest of the country on desktops and on servers. But in the grand scheme of things, the fact that Windows has failed to make it to phones made them a small player in the world compared to what they used to be. And this is what um, Steve Ballmer saw coming 10 years ago and he started throwing chairs around and throwing tantrums. He said, we have to get on the phones. If we don't get on phones, we'll be gone like the dinosaurs pretty soon. And they totally failed to get on the phones. They tried real hard, but Microsoft could not make a phone that anybody would use. And um, they, they're still making money, making record profits, but they're no longer important like they used to be. 15 years ago, they were like 99% of the desktops. They ruled. Now they're just one of the players and Android and Apple are big competitors on the side. So SNMP is something you might use to integrate these devices. SN, you can work on Windows servers too. This is used to manage servers, routers, switches, firewalls, and everything all over the network. It's been around for a long time. So like every protocol that's been around for a long time, the popular version is fantastically insecure. Um, the old version of it was SNMP version two, and you can just use SNMP walk to walk through it. And what this does is it uses these things called community strings, which are essentially passwords, and it sends them unencrypted over the network. And, and almost everybody leaves them at the default value, which is public for public information and private for private information. And that's what's used in almost every network even now because although there is a new version that's safer, you can only switch to the new version if you replace all your old equipment. And this is the song you've heard enough times, you're gonna get tired of hearing it. Legacy infrastructure means you can't upgrade to the new stuff. Not until you're willing to really throw away all that old stuff that still works. 
So it's real hard to understand why do I have to buy new stuff for the stuff that still works just because of some theoretical security problem. So a bunch of people continue to use the old unsafe stuff. And then there's Finger. Finger is used. Um, Finger was to get a user profile. This a Unix before there was the internet. There were Unix servers and they had chat and instant messages and social networking and profiles for people all using the same one server. All the people at one company or people connecting to it over the early version of the internet and you could just see what other users are using. So Finger will show you whether they're logged in when they read their email and a little profile. Um, you can use Nessus also. So you can Finger and it'll show you who's logged into the server. And uh, if you use Nessus, it will do the same thing on Linux that it does on any other operating system. It will have a huge library of tests and tests for thousands of problems and then tell you which problems it finds. Something's wrong with your FTP, there's a default password for the root account, and on you go. Various products installed on that server appear to have various vulnerabilities. And uh, NetDiscover is a fun tool for simple enumeration just to find out what's out there. This is an ARP scanner. Uh, scanning with ARP packets is the fastest and most reliable way to find things on a network. Even if you turn a firewall all the way up, it does not stop ARP because ARP is necessary to find the machine at all. If you do not respond to ARP, you cannot send or receive any traffic at all, so you might as well pull the cable. So scanning with ARP is the way to really find everything on a network, and this NetDiscover tool is very good at it. Um, Sparta is a nice... Um, hacking pen testing tool that combines a lot of things in one package. It'll automatically run Nmap and NetDiscover and other tools and find a whole series of vulnerabilities. It's one of the sort of sweet tools and it's in Kali. You can start this and let it run and it will find various things on the network. Uh, Sparta is probably more accurate than any other one tool by itself because what it does is it runs three or four tools in their standard setup for you. So it's a convenience. Yeah. But it takes maybe 10 minutes to do all that. All right, and I got more cahoots, and I'll take a look at the projects and see if there's something I should be saying about them. All right. There we go. All right, got a bunch of people online. This is Sparta, there you go. That guy was sort of like Trump. Fresh character just kicking people he doesn't like in the well. That's... Beer, that's right. <laughs> that was the thing about Kavanaugh's testimony going on about beer. There's just, he was so far from what he ought to be to be a Supreme Court justice. <laughs> You're supposed to be like dignified. <laughs> the president is a different job. He's acting, maybe he should quit running for the Supreme Court and run for president. Then he'd have the right demeanor, apparently. Anyway. All right, I'll wait a few more seconds, but maybe this is it. All right. Sixteen characters for each device. Okay, that's NetBIOS, Microsoft's LAN protocol back in the day when there were three or four competing LAN protocols before TCP IP took over. So which Kali tool tells you about Windows shares? Enum for Linux. 
does it. All right. Which one is a popular phone scanner? Nessus, very popular. These things are an important part of a pen test, but you can't trust them much. You have to back them up with manual tests. Which one of these is not Unix? MS-DOS is the only one here that's not Unix. By the way, I should mention there are a hundred different operating systems. There's these weird things like Minix you may have never heard of. And there are occasionally companies that write their own operating system. And if I was running a company and my staff said they wanted to write their own operating system, I would just fire them. Because whatever you're doing, you can do it with either Unix or Windows. And there's no way you want to be responsible for all the patches and updates and drivers and everything. How can it possibly be that my product is so weird I can't use Windows or Unix? That would be really hard to explain to anybody why you have to make your own thing. There are a few examples like Cisco's iOS is not Linux and not Windows. And the internal Cisco people got so angry, they quit and formed Juniper and be eating Cisco's lunch because Juniper runs Unix. And they keep saying, why are we using this junk instead of just using Unix? It's very hard to understand why there is anything other than Unix and Windows. They're both very versatile. Why would you need anything else? There are a bunch of others, but you've never heard of them because they're in the below 1% of these. Maybe to make something proprietary? Maybe to make something proprietary. I assume it starts because someone says, we have a special case, but then you could just write another driver or a function to add to one of these main platforms. It's, you know, like, why would you grow your own forest when you could just put a house on one that's already there? Anyway, um, all right. So which one will tell you about one Unix user? Okay, finger. Tells you about one user. Gives you their user profile in the old text-only world. So it looks like Erica made it with a very good name. And Jeffrey A made it twice. And Ken Tan, real names today. I don't think I have to work so hard to find out who people are as usual. That's nice. All right. So I'm going to just clean up and I'll go to the lab and help anybody who wants to work on projects. Oh, let me take a quick look and see if I need to say anything about these projects. I think they should be all right. Let me just see. Um, so these are available in the cloud, Metasploit, Nmap, there's Wireshark one. Uh, the Linux one, if you do not know any command line Unix, I added this. I couldn't find a good online tutorial about Unix. They all are like 100 pages of too much knowledge. So I just wrote one where you practice doing some simple Unix things. So if you haven't ever used command line Unix, you might go through this just so you learn like the basic 10 commands. You got to, um, the projects tell you how to do it, but you should understand the essential of a few simple commands in Unix. And I really should write one of these for PowerShell too. PowerShell is the new hotness. And uh, I might add that, in fact, that's probably the next thing I need to do. Now that I can get a Google Cloud machine, I can make a PowerShell injection exploit, which is awesome. I did one of the CTF, I gotta do that. that, that so that's, that's probably what I should put around here, 17 or 18. I got room for a couple more projects and that would be fun. Anyway, so um, I think that's all I'll say at the moment. Okay, I'll go to the cloud, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, when you've got all of those logs, you've got the three package yeah. type of things. Can you, uh, can you just search all of that for a term? Yes, here, let me bring one I up here. Let's, I tried to do that. And okay. Let's see if I've got one here. Here's some kind of data I got. All right, so here's Wireshark. And so, yes, this is, I'm glad you bring it up. Wireshark is a really important tool, and you should learn some things about how to use it. So let me. Okay, so when you run Wireshark, this is the list of packets one by one. And when a beginner start, they look at packets here one by one. This is for the birds. This is how I did it for years. Um, if you look down here, you see the, the, this packet taken apart. So you can see the individual fields. And down here is the raw binary for the packet. You almost never look at that. This you look at rarely. The way to use Wireshark is to use the aggregation functions. 
if you want to learn what's going on with this exchange, like there's a get, you right click and follow the TCP stream. This is probably the single most useful thing. This shows you the requests and responses without any of the addresses. So the red is what I sent, the blue is what the server replied, then I might have sent another red one and have another blue one. You see the whole conversation right there across many packets, laid out the way it looked on the screen. That's very useful. And another thing that's very useful is the statistics. Like statistics conversations will show you that this server went to that server, it sent 3,000 bytes this way, then it sent some data this way on different ports. You see all the exchanges in TCP, in IP, and in Ethernet, all the different devices, who they talked to, and how long they talked. And um, you can also see protocol statistics. So these, are, these, are the, these things here are very useful. This is the protocol hierarchy showing you how much of all these different protocols were used. Here's the HTTP, how many percent of things. A quick way to find out what's there and zero in on interesting things. And the other thing that's extremely useful is this filter bar. So if I want to find something, I can put like frame contains a string. And if this was in any of the packets, I'll find the packets with that string in it. And I can also filter for IP address, like ip.adder equals this address. So the way you do a search command is frame contains. Is what? The way you search for a string is frame contains. Uh, that's one way. Yes, this is the easiest way. You can also do searches up here. If I clear this, I can do edit find. And this will hunt through and let me type in things to find by. But there's, um, you can search for things this way. It has a variety of search functions. But the main thing you use is this filter bar right here to quickly find what you need. And the statistics to sort of see if there's something exciting. That's, those are good ways to start. And there's all yeah, maybe I should teach it someday. There's a Wireshark cert I got. There's a whole book to prepare you for the search. It might make a good class. I'm not sure it's entirely worth it, but it is a pretty good idea. Wireshark is a very useful tool. I found that to be the most thing to look at so far. What's that? I found that to be one of the neatest things to look at so far. Yes. One thing about Wireshark is especially for NetPlus, Wireshark is how you learn how networking works. It makes it easy to see what every packet is and what they do and what all the layers are. So it's real important for NetPlus to understand what the addresses are and how ARP works and how DNS works. This is very useful. All right, good. All right, well, I'm gonna stop this and go to the lab. Oh, there's a chat message. Let's see, uh, scapy server online. I could not get it to respond. 9.2 scapy server. Well, let me take a look. Nine, a server. Um, this is, you just do it in your own colleague. AD dot, this, this AD is online. Um, oh, maybe 9900 is not up. Let me take a look. That's, I'll check that. Okay. Um, what's that? Yeah. What 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 assignment was that? Uh, eight. Eight. All right. Let me take a look. Uh, I'm not sure. So this doesn't work. Well, let me just one one thing at a time. This guy's asked a question. I'm just going to check it right now because I can do it quickly. Um, he said nine doesn't work. Let's see. Okay. She was telling me something is wrong. What is going on here? Ah, oh, there we are. Let me see if I can. Uh, deduce anything about this. Uh, just a moment, I've got to get my collie up. And I'm going to SSH into it. Okay, there's collie. All right, well, this is, let me, I have config. Okay. SSH root at 192.168.225.130. All right, service. Come on. Okay, SSH start. All right. There we go. So now, uh, let me just try this stuff, that stuff. 
Okay. And now send this junk up there and the server should reply. All right. And it, this might reply if I give it a password. Let's see. And then again, maybe not. Perhaps it is down. Uh, let me check something here. I can do AD and I should have netstat 5.html. Uh, netstat uh, blast. Somewhere there's a netstat. You can see what listening ports on this machine. Um, all right, I'll have to check into that. People tell me something's wrong with that project. Maybe something is wrong with my server. It does get hacked all the time. So let me make a note. Project 9 UDP isn't up. I'll check it in the lab and see if I have to restart it or something. And what's wrong with Project 8? Well, it was just in my case. I couldn't, I couldn't uh, submit it on HTTPS. Okay, let's see. Project 8, HTTPS. HTTPS. Eight, you mean you couldn't turn in the answer? Right. Oh, uh, that's probably just because this submit here to, what is this nonsense? Okay, right. So this, submit query, that works. So it, it didn't work for you? No, I didn't. Huh, okay, well that's a little weird. This is Netscape. This is Netscape, I quit using Chrome. So maybe it's a Chrome issue. Yeah. All right, well good. Well, I'll check Project 9 and see if I have to restart something on the server. Maybe something is down. Thank you for telling me. Let me stop the share, and uh, I'll go to the left.